it is our unique delight. We don't have uh, dueling artists tonight. We just have the great, great pleasure of working with someone whose beautiful uh, untitled work is in the University Art Gallery just next door. Helen Pashkin is um, a longtime producer of really, really remarkably experimental and beautiful multi-dimensional um, art here in Southern California, a native of this part of the world. Helen has agreed to be with us tonight to talk about not only her work and the work of, um, of her lifetime, which is on show here and elsewhere. I'll tell you a little bit more about where you can see more of Helen's work. But Helen was also someone who knew Gerald Buck very well. And so I want to begin by asking Helen to say a little bit about her relationship. I'm not going to talk in the third person. Your relationship with Gerald Buck. So Helen Pashkin. delighted to be here tonight <clears throat> after slogging down from Pasadena. And I, I just want to say that I am here actually to honor the life of Gerald Buck. What a remarkable man he was and passionate about art in a way that I think I've never encountered ever before. And the way I met him was, I think, fairly typical of what I've heard before. <laughs> I, I was uh, hosting um, in my studio in Pasadena a group from one of the museums here, I don't remember which one it was, and um, we were very careful to say that only 15 were allowed, and they came by bus, and they did say, well, there may be a latecomer who was coming on his own. So already, I was already, you know. <laughs> Half an hour later, in walked this man, and, um, and it was Gerald Buck, and we had a wonderful exchange, all of us, and then afterwards, he said, you know, Helen, if it's all right with you, I'd like to stay a little longer. Well, it really wasn't, but I said, all right. So <laughs> he said, do you uh, have any of your early work made in the late 60s, such as a small egg shape or one of the spheres? And he was extremely knowledgeable about what I had done. And I thought, oh, well, this, isn't, this is not what I expected. He said, well, sometime I would like to come it, with your permission and uh, if you have some, let's see what you have. And I said, I may have one or two in the back storage somewhere. He said, well, what about right now? <laughs> so we went back to the storage, and I did find a couple of them. He said, I'll take that one and that one. Now, what else do you have? <laughs> That's how we met. <laughs> and uh, uh, it turned out that in the end, Gerald owned four of Helen's works. Um, all of them will be appearing on the screen tonight. One of them is in the current show. And as we move through further iterations of bringing the Buck Collection out to the world, you'll just be amazed and delighted to see some of the other work that Helen has produced. Keep in mind that Helen's work began, your work began um, in, in the early 60s as part. We can begin the rollover of this, if you like. <coughs> Yes, you're doing, uh, the, the image that you see, by the way, and there are about 30 of them in this presentation that we'll just repeat um, every 30 seconds or so, is in chronological order. So these very early works are the experimental works that Helen was doing using these very new materials that were being produced by, largely by the, um, the aerospace industry in Southern California and new high tech that was being developed in this part of the world. It's very characteristic of the really experimental work done by Southern California artists in the, uh, really the late 50s, 60s, and early 70s. So you'll see some really, really remarkably, absolutely beautiful work uh, from the early years that Helen produced. And one of the things we're going to explore in the conversation we're now starting is the whole idea of what is it that's unique about Southern California art. Gerald Buck collected California art. And if you've seen the First Glimpse exhibition, you know that there's a tremendous amount of work from Northern California as well, from the Bay Area, um, from the Carmel area, et cetera. Um, it's very different from the work produced in Southern California. One of the rooms in the University Art Gallery next door is devoted to the um, 
amazing work that the so-called light and space movement did. Helen is a part of that group. And in those spaces, you will see work by people like Larry Bell, Peter Alexander, Craig Kaufman, Robert Irwin, John McCracken, Bruce Nauman, James Terrell. Everyone on the list that I've just read taught in the art department at UCI. And so the art and space movement, although we were never lucky enough to convince Helen to become part of the faculty here, uh, she, worked, she got her BA in, in Pomona and then for a period of time went east for a period of time in Columbia and then an art history MA at Boston University, then began work on a doctorate in art history at Harvard. You tell, tell that story a little bit about your doctoral time and how you actually moved from being a, a nascent academic <laughs> to being a practical producing artist. It's a great story. Well, <clears throat> I was, um, um, I've been studying art history for five or six years and I was very excited about a particular uh, etching of Rembrandt that I was working on at the time. And I was writing to present a five hour oral a talk and I got very, very deeply involved. I lived in Cambridge and I was doing some research at the Widener Library. And so someone said, well, you need to go to the Fog Museum and talk to Jakob Rosenberg, who was the great Dutch scholar uh, in the world. Uh, I was looking at a lot of uh, early work um, writings that referred to parts of Rembrandt's life and they were all in Dutch. And they said, he's, he can translate them for you if he's sufficiently interested in what you're doing. <laughs> so I was all 22 or 23 years old and I went and I found him at the uh, Fog Museum and, and I said what my idea was and I said I was having quite a bit of trouble uh, because I was stuck with the language and he said, he said, well, young lady, he said, you go come back in one week and you tell me uh, what you propose to do and I'll see if I'm interested. So I came back and I wrote a paragraph and showed it to him and he said, ah, he says, this is very, very interesting. This is exactly the opposite of what my colleagues in Amsterdam think. He said, I think this is quite interesting, actually. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will get you into my doctoral program and we will work on this idea together. Now I knew because uh, I had a professor at Pomona that had spent 15 years getting her doctorate at Harvard. And I knew that it took a long, long time. And of course, if you had the bad luck to have the professor die, then it took much longer. <laughs> so I thought about it and I thought about it. And I'd, I'd been in the academic world for many years and I decided that this was not my path. And so I politely went back and told him I was <clears throat> not uh, um, going to be able to do that. And I don't know if I remember if I told you this, Stephen, but recently I was speaking with Michael McGovern, the director of the County Museum, in my studio, and we were, he, he did all his academic work in the East Coast. We were talking about this, and he said, Oh, Helen, you're so stupid. He said, If you'd gotten your doctorate under Jakob Rosenberg, you could have taught at any university in the world, and you could have been part of any museum in the world. And then he stopped. He said, oh, it doesn't matter. It worked out all right anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Um, by the way, um, not only can you see Helen's work here in our exhibition, you only can see one, but if you happen to be going to London anytime in the next month or so, the Hayward Gallery in London is currently showing Helen's work. Um, we'll be so on until... It's a group show. Oh, okay, it's a group show, but more than one piece. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's on at the moment, and starting in the new year, um, there's a, a fabulous show that's going to be happening in Santa Fe in January and February at the Charlotte Jackson Fine Arts in Santa Fe, and then in the summer at the Vito Schnabel Gallery, uh, which is in both Samaritz and New York. There will be a further show. We're not saying anything after the summer. Who knows what's going to happen after the summer? So Helen, as you can see, is not only madly producing new work, um, but showing it as well. We're just extremely fortunate in that regard. Um, a couple of the people we've had at the Art Talks have decided essentially to stop working. And one of the amazing things about Helen's work is that it is so 
exploratory and so such a pioneering use of materials and so conceptually oriented toward the amazing qualities of perception that we, we're, we're just amazed by every new piece that comes out. In fact, one of the things that happened is we've talked through the course of the day is that Helen, will, you'll begin to tell me about something that you're doing currently and then say, oh, can't talk about that because it isn't done yet, it isn't out yet. So there's a whole set of new things that'll be coming in the next um, short period of time. I want to let you know that I'm not the only one who says these kinds of things about Helen. Helen brought up Michael Govan, who's the director of the of Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, his comment about Helen is that she is not just a great pioneer of the light and space movement, but one of the great pioneers of art generally. Very high praise from somebody who n knows his art. And one of the things I want to do tonight in talking with you, Helen, is, is to look at a couple of aspects of what Michael means by that general notion of your pioneering uh, spirit. And I told you when we were preparing for this tonight that I think uh, two of the great influences on you were the light that you experienced, and this has to do with nostalgia as well, the light that you experienced in Crystal Cove as a little girl light in the tide pools, light on the ocean, uh, and the way in which that then is bookended by your studies on the East Coast of the great Dutch Golden Age, particularly with Vermeer. I bring up Vermeer rather than Rembrandt because Vermeer is always fascinated by indirect light sources, by the way in which light plays in space, and plays across objects, so that it's both material and immaterial. And one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating, quite magical, I think Helen is a magician, and one of the ways in which I think of the magic of your work is this play of the relationship between materiality and immateriality. That is to say, this remarkable way in which you use, craft, play with, uh, engineer fabricate these seemingly impossible materials and, on the other hand, the way in which these works are absolutely ethereal. And th the best story I've ever heard about this uh, comes out of your 1971 artist-in-residence at Caltech, where a number of artists came. I think there were four of you, yeah. Peter Alexander and you and two others, and you were asked to come and give a presentation about the spheres you were doing at the time, gave a presentation to the scientists who knew nothing about art. Tell, tell, tell the audience I, about um, that. At Caltech, I was uh, working with the um, um, head of the chemical engineering department who were very involved theoretically with polymers. And a number of the light space artists, myself included, were working with polyester resin. How many of you here have ever heard of polyester resin? <laughs> oh, nobody. <laughs> it's a, this is an extremely toxic material that was developed um, during World War II and after the war it was declassified and uh, somehow found its way into art stores and craft stores and I got some and so did many other. Dwayne Valentine worked with it and a number of other people, Peter Alexander. And I think the Caltech experience, was, I was hoping it would be very enlightening because a lot of these chemists had studied um, all the linkages between, uh, with the polyester and how they linked chemically. And I hoped that I would be able to learn from them and control the material, which is extremely difficult to control. And so uh, one day, the, pro the professor, the head of the department, said, Helen, why don't you come? I have, every, once a month, I have a luncheon seminar in my offices. And we have um, mostly chemists, but physicists sometimes, and, and certainly scientists from JPL that are working on the moonshot and other space materials. And they're very knowledgeable about some of these materials, but none of them have ever talked to an artist about them before. And since you're in this program, would you be kind enough to come to the seminar and bring a few slides, bear in mind we're talking about the little 35 millimeter slides of old, 
and, and we will project them on a screen and then bring uh, some of the small objects that you made and that you physically made. So uh, I was delighted to do that and there were about 20 of us sitting around. Everyone was quite fascinated because theoretically they knew a great deal about these materials, but as a, as a practical application, they knew very, they knew almost nothing. And these were very nice little seductive spheres and other shapes, some of which have been up here. And so um, I put them on the table. I started to talk. We talked. We looked at the slides, and everyone was interested except for one man, and he was very rigid, and he was sitting like this, and he was, you know, like this. And the more I talked, the more rigid he became, and the more, the angrier he became. And I didn't, I couldn't figure out what I was saying. It was incorrect. And so I talked on and on and on, and finally he spoke up, and I was, I was telling about how I created these spheres from the inside out by creating first a small clear sphere and then casting it into a hemisphere, into a cylinder, excuse me, and then casting that into a hemisphere, and so on and so on. At that point, he slammed his fist down the table and said, absolutely impossible. There's no way you can do that. It can't be done. And then the head of the department said, well, she's done it, it's right here. <laughs> well, that doesn't, I don't care what she says, it can't be done. And so they all started laughing. Whereupon, he got up, and he walked out of the room and slammed the door. And so I said to the head of the department, I'm so terribly sorry that I have created this. I don't know what I've said that has upset him so much. He said, no, there's no way that you could have known that you have totally demolished his doctoral thesis. <laughs> <laughs> the scientist couldn't do it, even theoretically, but Helen was doing it right there on the table. And the reason, the reason I wanted to bring that up and have tell, uh, Helen tell you that story is that um, it would be very easy to see a number of these pieces as being rather machinic, rather mechanical. And the amount, not only of ingenuity and artistic creativity, but literally of hundreds of hours of work, physical, manual work that goes into the production of these pieces, um, best characterized by the amazing overnight story of you and Jack preparing the, the sphere for the, for the show that wasn't going to be done in time. Well, that was a big uh, six-foot disc, the oh, very first one that was well, made. So, looks like a machine. Tell the Jack Brogan story about the big disc. At Caltech, I was uh, working on a very large disc, and I didn't know how to make a mold or anything, so I just made a huge pancake on the floor. Um, and then I had a heavy-duty sander, and I would lean down over it and uh, work on it for months. So the show was coming up, and I was sanding it by hand and trying to get ready to polish it. And Peter Alexander, my colleague, said, Helen, you're never going to get that ready in time for the opening tomorrow. I said, I know. He said, but I do know someone in Venice who can probably help you. He gave me his name. I called him up. It's Jack Brogan, who some of you have probably heard of. I know, Robin, you have. And uh, my friend Robin Clark is here tonight. And uh, <coughs> Jack Brogan came and took a look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and he said, oh, yes, I think we can do something with that. Well, he got five men. It was very, very heavy, and they picked it up, they took it in the truck to Venice, where he worked, and they worked all night, and they polished it um, <clears throat> with water, with a big, big uh, machine, and I went over for a while and watched the working on it. It was quite new to me and exciting and fascinating, and the next day they got it back just in time for the opening, and they set it up in a big wooden base, <clears throat> and uh, that was... Uh, my first introduction to fabricating. That piece was at Caltech for a week. <laughs> and then the uh, curator, the, the uh, young gallery person called me and she said, Helen, you better come right over. I said, why? She said, well, this morning I came, unlocked the door and I came into the gallery and I looked around and I thought there was something wrong, but I couldn't tell exactly what. So 
So I walked around again and I noticed that your piece was missing. Now bear in mind that it took five men to lift it. Caltech mounted a uh, search, quite prolonged, and it was never found. So somewhere, maybe one of you, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere that is residing. And when I begin to show the new ones, which I hope will be soon, it may appear. <laughs> Right. One of the things you can tell, just in terms of that story and the way the fabrication and the loving care that goes into the fabrication, is that this kind of work is playing between materiality and immateriality. And the idea of this absolutely pristine polishing of the surface allows for both the perfection of the material, but also for that translucency of the, the quality of the material that a, that a single scratch would ruin. And so one of the things I think that's one of your mantras is that if there's a scratch, it's all you see. And Yes. Uh, early on, before this group of us uh, was called Light Space, it was called Finish Fetish. And we hated both. We didn't like either of the terms. We're stuck with Light Space, but Finish Fetish is a very derogatory, uh, we don't know who first uh, came up with that. It was actually John Copeland's was chair John of the Copeland? art department here. Oh, well, he's, he's, <laughs> let, he's gone, hasn't he? Yeah, he's, he's gone. We can, yeah. oh, we can say terrible things about him. Well, and the reason is because it isn't about the finish. Oh. It's about uh, looking through, um, Robin Clark mounted an amazing show at the Pacific Standard Time in uh, La Jolla in San Diego. And, and she had three of my small spheres and they were placed so dramatically and so in such an interesting way that if you look through them on one side, you could see the ocean actually hmm. through it. And um, the, the, the idea is that the ones that were completely clear uh, such as some the early work of, of Larry Bell, those early works of mine, the very small pieces of Peter Alexander's at the beginning, Dwayne Valentine, and and even someone like um, the uh, scrim pieces by uh, Doug, what's his name? Doug Wheeler. Wheeler. Doug mm -hmm. Wheeler. If um, the reason that the surfaces had to be pure is because if there was, a, as you say, even a hairline scratch, that's all you'd see. And you wouldn't see through it. You wouldn't see the refractions or the reflections of light or any of it. And um, if there, uh, Doug, there was a beautiful scrim by Doug Wheeler in the San Diego part of that show, and if there is a bug crawling on it, that's all you would see. You wouldn't see the totality and the magnificence of the piece. And that's why the finish is important, but only a means to an end. Uh, three of those little spheres are in London at the Hayward Gallery, and they're not near a wall. They're sticking out on pedestals in space. And I've heard that there are thousands of people all the time crowding around them, taking <laughs> selfies or the picture of their great aunt through them. <laughs> and so, I don't know, they, they have a new life now. <laughs> And so you can see, I'm sure you can tell, it's very frustrating. Normally, um, we should have had a feedback screen here so that Helen could see what's on the screen. We're, we, we're not acrobats, so we're not going to keep close track of what's going on behind us. But you can clearly see that that notion of the pristine surface um, it, it operates in a kind of prismatic way so that it's not about stopping the light. It's about pre precisely about allowing the light to come through and creating the effects of that translucency, that transparency, where as the light comes through the object, it is actually remade. There is a renaissance of the light as a result of the color. Actually, one of the spheres that's here is a clear sphere. I understand there's a rumor that there's a black sphere coming. That, uh, sorry, I gave a secret away. But you can see, uh, by the way, the, the red-orange sphere that you see passing by every few minutes up above here is ours. And so it, um, it's, uh, it will be on display certainly at one of our next uh, exhibitions. And as I was telling Helen earlier, when you 
confront this fear given the lighting on it, when you look at it in a certain light, it has that red-orange quality. 90 degrees away, it's become blue because of the way the angle of the light coming into the sphere is refracted through it and out the other side. The sphere isn't colored, it's colored by light. And so although there's a lot of play with color in the, in the, in the, resin, in the resin, obviously, it, it's not, um, that's not the main effect. And so when I say that we're talking about transparency and translucency, um, there is really no artist making use of the whole idea of light and space in the way in which Helen does, because the light becomes the, the energy source for the piece, as you see over and over again. And so one of the effects, of course, is the absolutely sublime sensual experience of actually being able to do in the gallery what you can't do here, where you're looking at a two-dimensional image, a photographic image, no matter how high res this is, it does absolutely no justice to the piece itself, which I guarantee to you truly is magical. And one of the ways I like to think about it is that something that Helen works on, I keep talking about you in the third person, one of the things that, that you do is to produce something that is beyond words. There's a way in which there isn't any way to actually put into words what is happening in these pieces because they are to be caught in the immediacy of your seeing them. There's a way in which you as the viewer, even looking at this slideshow, um, you can well understand how even in two dimensions, your own experience of the way in which the light and the space are in concert together in each of these pieces is the way in which they work. And so each one of these pieces is displaying its hidden depths, its immateriality. So there are surfaces, play of hidden spaces, other surfaces, all playing within the sphere of the way in which light treats space. That's why I personally like the, the Vermeer analogy, because Vermeer always works with indirect light. What you're seeing is the play of light in the in-between space and light reflected from and refracted in the objects from which the light is bouncing. <clears throat> Regarding Vermeer, I think that all the light and space artists in some way would um, feel aligned with Vermeer, although they would probably not say that. They might. <laughs> I've never discussed it with any of them. I think that the scene, because of the pieces I'm working on right now, and thinking about Vermeer, and particularly his interior scenes where the light enters from a window and bathes and defines everything within the space, whether it's a loaf of bread, whether it's the sleeve of the woman, whatever it is, it's a soft, very gentle light, not always a warm light, sometimes very cold, but it, it does envelop the space. and. I've been thinking particularly about Vermeer lately because these newest works, which have not yet been shown, uh, are, um, are hark back to and are an echo of the early work at Caltech, although they have no edge. They simply dissolve into nothingness, and it's taken a very long time to do that, technically. So one of the, there are di dichotomies with this very new work. They are, um, they look weightless, totally weightless. And yet they, the 60-inch the ones that I'm doing now weigh about 250 pounds. <laughs> and so that's one of the dichotomies that I'm playing with and I'm working with. And um, the other one is that there's no edge and it has dissolved since our brains like to define everything for us. We like to define an edge. We like to search for it till we find it. But when we can't, and, and we relax and realize we can, we can just enjoy the color that floats there by itself, or seems to float by itself. To me, this is very, very interesting, because what it does is it pulls the viewer back into themselves. And I have a, a very dear friend who's a museum director, and she says, the viewer is necessary to complete the work of art which I find to be a fascinating idea, any work of art. Mm -hmm. And, um, but particularly in this case, 
I see that people, uh, the, the few people that have seen them, each see something totally different because they are drawn back into themselves and they, they see whatever person that they are at that moment. So if they were to come again, as we were discussing earlier, they are a different person with different concerns and they would tend to see a different piece. That leads me to think about the way in which you've also, in addition to playing with light, you've also played with, I say play in the most serious of ways, played with the absence of light. Because frequently you like your works to be seen in very low light, yeah. which creates that sense not only of something picked out of the darkness, which gives that floating quality, but there's also a, a, an instance you told me about in which the object can actually seem literally to disappear. I'm thinking about the famous red sphere that the, where you had the light go down to nothing. Yes. Can you tell that? Uh, let's see. Oh, we were no, you where, the guy, the red where the guy thought there was something there. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a lens, Yeah. a lens shape, but just like the lens in your eye. I had a, a few people to my studio when I was taking these smaller pieces down to an extremely low light, and they're very pale to begin with. And it's just color in the center, which is almost outward. And if you lower the light sufficiently, you're not sure whether you're seeing something or whether you're seeing the memory of what you saw. So I had people close their eyes and open their eyes, and when their eyes were closed, I took the piece away. And one man opened his eyes and he said, well, I still see it. It's a very, very soft, darkish red, or what was it red? Just a, just a hint in front of me. And I said, are you sure you see it? He said, absolutely. Well, there was nothing there to see. He was remembering what he had seen. So it, this, this work gets into the area of memory and what we really do perceive and that's, I think, where my uh, interest lies at the mm -hmm. moment. So, uh, very interesting to think about the way in which you play with all, all, virtually all ways in which you can actually use light even in its absence. Because one of the very interesting dark aspects of what you do, as you say, is that the work appeals to something inside. It appeals to each viewer. I don't even like to call them viewers. I like to call people experiencers yes. because you're not just viewing the work. I mean, it has an impact on you. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the, the, the three very proper Chinese ladies who came oh. to your studio. If you'd be... All right, one more story. <laughs> How are we doing here? We're doing fine. Um, okay, getting back to the... This is unfair because... It, there's nothing up there to, uh, to show you, um, but you will see them soon. Uh, one of the, these is a very large uh, disc, which is in a dark room. And then I want to say something about James Terrell after that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, oh, I bumped into a woman at an art event in Pasadena, which happens all the time. She said, oh, Helen, may I please come to your studio sometime? And I said, oh, sure, anytime you like, <clears throat> thinking, of course, Immediately forgot her, thinking I'd never hear from her again. Unfortunately, about three weeks later, she called him. She said, oh, you remember me? I'm Mrs. Ho. And I, I you kindly invited me to your studio. May I come? And she said, next week I'd like to come because my cousin from Hong Kong will be here. And I want to bring another friend. So I said, of course. They came. They were very proper. They sat right on the <coughs> edges of their chairs like this and uh, were dressed in perfect 50s um, suits just below the knee, high heels, diamond pin. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh dear, what am I, this is gonna be a shock. <laughs> so they sat in that position in total silence for one minute, two minutes, three minutes. Now I'm panicked. I don't know what to do, because there's no reaction from anyone. And then all of a sudden, I heard a sound. 
It got louder and louder. It was the woman from Hong Kong, and she was crying. And then she stopped just as quickly as she had started, and she said, oh, I'm so humiliated. I've humiliated myself. I'm so embarrassed. Please forgive me. And I said, oh, I was so grateful. I said, oh, I'm, any, any response is just fine. And then we all started talking, and she became very articulate and said, I have no idea why I feel so emotional. This was a very, very pale green piece with a slight blue in the center. She said, I have no idea why I feel so emotional about this. It must be something precognitive or just on the edge of cognition. When I was about two or three years old, I must have seen something, either floating in space or something in this color, but I can't get back to what it was. But whatever it was, it was so powerful that now, and I don't know, she was probably in her 50s or so, um, between that time and now, it has remained in my uh, unconscious memory, probably, and this is called it forth. And so they departed, and I was fascinated by that, and about three weeks later, I got a letter from the woman in Pasadena, and she said, I, I just, I received a long, long uh, message from my cousin in Hong Kong. She's been traveling north and in western China with guides. She's quite an adventurous. And she, she said that she told me that a number of times while she was traveling, and even um, when she was in the, in the center of Hong Kong walking around with all the people um, on the street at noon, she would sometimes see this hovering pale green above her. And even on the airplane flying back to China, she saw it once in the middle of the night. So I find that very interesting. Somehow, someone I had never known and someone who knew nothing about me or my work um, what, saw something so powerful that she recalls it when she least suspects. I wanted to say something about darkness Durrell. related to James Terrell. Um, <clears throat> James Terrell has an ex-in-law here, or something, what would you call yourself? <laughs> a relative cousin. of James, a cousin of James Terrell is here tonight. And my old next door neighbor, so I was <laughs> awfully glad to see him. James Terrell just gave, recently gave a lecture <clears throat> um, about one of the newest pieces he's done. He's doing a piece now for the Emir of Hor Hormuz. I don't know if any of you know where the Strait of Hormuz is, a very dangerous part of the world. But he's doing a piece. And just before he started that, he completed a piece in the Yucatan jungle. And I said, do I need my machete to go and see it? No, he said, but it is in the jungle, that there is a road. He was invited by a couple who, uh, billionaires who are, um, Mexicans, and they are um, uh, restoring part of the Mayan uh, ruins in this particular area. And so they asked him if he would consider doing one of his own skyscape pieces, sky space pieces, in the shape of a Mayan temple. And he said, I was so intrigued by this, I said yes, before I realized <laughs> what it might entail. Anyway, he showed a number of pictures of this, and it's fascinating because these works of his take place in darkness. Either there's one at Pomona College, which we, which, which we have, which is open to the public. You can all go and see it. It's the only one in Southern California. And you can either go before dawn, before the sun comes up, and there's a half hour of light, different lights that he's programmed. Um, uh, 750,000 LED, tiny LED lights. And, or you go uh, at dusk and you watch it until it's completely dark. So darkness is very, very important for this light to occur. In uh, Mexico, he has this big uh, thing going up like temple, but you walk into it and there's hard packed earth. I can't think of the name of them, maybe you know. The pools uh, of, of uh, fresh water. Yes, they're very deep and you can see 100 feet down. Yes. And um, right in the center, there's one of, the, one of those pools. And he has made st stairways 
going down about 50 feet, 50 of them. And so um, afterwards I asked him, I said, Can, could I jump into the pool and dive down 50 feet and then walk up the stairs? He said, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and, then you, and then you come to the, to the ground level, to the earth, and then he has stairs that continue up to the top. And then you can look out over the jungle at actually the Mayan ruins. And there's a light program in that. One of the most magnificent things I've ever seen in my life. Amazing, and of course it's very similar to the Road and Crater Project. Yeah. In the University Art Gallery, you'll see a big wooden box that's open part way. It's um, a James Terrell maquette of a project that he's doing in Northern Arizona. He bought a volcano, literally bought a volcano, and is turning it into a lunar and solar observatory over a period of time. He's working on it now over the years, um, actually excavating chambers below it with oculi that that show the sky, because the work is about the sky. It's about the way in which this control of the light source actually focuses your attention on the sky. So this is very similar, though in, in some ways even more magical. What you've done is to go back to the absolutely fundamental geometric forms from which all art Excuse me. evolves. That is one of the new pieces. Oh, that's the last, that's the last one. So that's, that's an example of the most recent work. That, it, it's much more subtle than this. It doesn't look like this, but that's basically. So you can see that it, it literally disappears at the perimeters, even though it's very heavy, very solid, um, just vanishes because of the incredible quality of the fabrication that takes the material literally down to a knife edge at the outer, where you really can't tell where the piece ends and the rest of the room begins. That's the way in which, the, that's the kind of perfection. If you're going to do this kind of thing, it has to be to that kind of quality. And you've seen in every one of these 25 or 30 images, and if you see more of Helen's work, you'll know that what you do is to have the same exacting standards. And one of the most, I've tried to bring up the way in which you have these wonderful dichotomies of materiality, immateriality, of uh, subtlety and the weight of the material, of the whole notion of transparency and translucency, mediation and immediacy. All of these dichotomies are part of what you do. But in the end, you do it all on these absolutely fundamental, elemental geometric, geometric shapes. And you can see it in Larry Bell's work. You can see it in, in uh, Duane Valentine's work, Peter's early work. And Mary we have Course. Mary Corse's work as well with the glass beads. And by the way, all of the people we're talking about you can see in the gallery. So uh, right next to Helen's piece that's there. The one thing that that piece in the, that we're showing doesn't do, although it does it in a different way now that I think about it, is to play with this idea of the relationship between the elemental shape and an absolutely astonishing, I would say magical, complexity of the way in which, through the use of light, color, and space, the, the simplest of forms and shapes has this fantastic, infinite life. I mean, it, it, for me, the way in which these pieces work is a, a, a new kind of way of talking about the sublime of talking about something that is ineffable, that is not subject to description. It is beyond words. And actually, I think that's something, if I'm not wrong, I think that's something that you think about, the space and, that and words can't reach. That's right. I don't, it's not conscious, probably. But, but light is um, the, the closest. Pure light is probably the closest one can come to something like that. Um, for the art historians here, you know that all through the history of art, um, the things that people were considered, that every student considers, are form, color, and composition. Slightly different for sculpture, but for painting, certainly, form, color, composition. And that's always been the case until about 50 years ago. when And light, oh, and by the way, light was always used to define an edge, uh, to, to uh, show an expression on a face, to show fur on a little dog like the Van Eyck's did. 
um, when oil painting was discovered. Um, but light has always been in the service of form, color, or competition. But when all of us began working with light as the primary factor, and all of the other things were then became subservient to light, this was a, a distinct change. Right. Where light, light was this fear, and I would like to, because my voice is going, end with this um, something about light. And I just want to say a couple more words about Gerald Buck. And oh, and I'm not, um, I, I would be delighted to answer any questions from you individually, but I don't take questions in a public situation, but at the reception. I just wanted to say that uh, as I got to know Gerald Buck, I realized how passionate he was about art and how remarkable this was. He thought about it all the time, I think. And he would call me up and say, Helen, come down to the uh, post office in Laguna and I'll meet you in the alley and we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see my latest acquisitions. And then we'll go to the Surf and Sand for lunch like we always do. And we would do that. We'd go to Surf and Sand and he would talk nonstop about art. I don't know why I was there. I mean, I guess just to listen. But we did that Monologue. many times, and he. Would, I realized what a, what a life that was. What a person, and how wonderful it is that UCI has this collection, which I, which we hope will grow. I've written down a few words in closing that I want to read to you, and then we'll um, adjourn. Okay. Yep. About a month ago, I attended a Disney Hall presentation of the West Coast premiere a remarkable oratorio. The composer was Rena Eshmael, a young Californian. Perhaps some of you heard it. Throughout this complex piece, she often referred to light, always as an ancient, spiritual, or metaphorical context. Now, if we were to make a quick leap to the visual arts, and to Gerald Buck in particular, we might discover a strange connection. Gerald believed that all California art, no matter what the stylistic approach, had the same basic instinct towards light. Not a metaphorical light, but rather an actual atmospheric light. He often said this atmosphere, which he, def he would define carefully, this, there was a unique atmosphere, he believed, in Southern California. And he believed that that was the basis of all California art, whether the artist even knew it or not. Now, if we leap back to the music, near the end of this incredible and complex oratorio, the composer introduces a poetic phrase. And oddly enough, it's a phrase that could have also come from Gerald Buck when he thought about all the 30 or 40,000 artists that he's collected. In this music it says, the lamps may be different, but the light is the same. The lamps may be different, but the light is the same.